may be seated. Shall we open our Bibles at this time to the book of 1 Kings, chapter 22? I love Old Testament narrative. The Bible says that the things that happened unto them, meaning the, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel, the things that happened unto them happened for our examples. Uh, we have learning lessons all through the Old Testament. And in particular, the Old Testament uh, is, is designed and given to us by God to lead us to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. But in addition to that, there are many stories, there are many narratives that give us lessons for life. And I love this particular story that we find in uh, 1 Kings 22 because it shows the courage of a man who is willing to stand alone, who is willing to take a stand that is unpopular and pay a price for it. Sometimes in Christian life, we may be called upon by God to stand alone, to take a, a position that others are not happy with and try to uh, coerce us to change. And so here we find this text in which we have a setting in which Ahab, the wicked king of the northern kingdom of Israel, they have a divided kingdom at this time, the northern kingdom is basically just wicked all the time, and the southern kingdom is only wicked about half the time. Uh, but they all have a problem with idolatry. They all have a problem with not listening to the Lord. But there's a good king named Jehoshaphat, and he, he's a good king. He really is. He makes some decisions that aren't that wise, but he's basically a good king. Uh, but he goes into an alliance with Ahab, the wicked king to the north, uh, to fight against a common foe. And it made sense politically. It made sense militarily. But it wasn't God's will to be done. And so here we find this setting. We come to 1 Kings uh, chapter uh, 22, and we will see the setting. And there continued uh, three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth in Gilead is ours, and that we be still? And, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, uh, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth-Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. So here we have the good king to the south, and he is making an alliance with the wicked king to the north, but they have a common enemy. And so he says, let's inquire at the Lord. Now look what happens in verse 6. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, you would think that would be enough. You'd think that would settle it. But now, have you ever noticed there's something about phoniness that you can just kind of tell? Jehoshaphat heard that, and it didn't ring true with him. It just seemed phony. For one thing, Ahab had a habit of putting just anybody into the priesthood, and their prophets were false prophets. They had well, just as easily worship Baal as worship Jehovah. Uh, and so Jehoshaphat knew the difference between a prophet of God and a false prophet. And so he heard them all say the same thing with all of this great oratory. And, and notice what he says. Uh, he says, and Jehoshaphat said, is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Now, I love reading between the lines in stories like this, because there are subtleties here, and we'll see more of them as we go along. Reading between the lines, we, we get the idea here that Jehosh Jehoshaphat isn't satisfied with the prophecy of 400 prophets. Uh, it wasn't enough for him to feel like, okay, the Lord's in it. And so he asked this question, isn't there a prophet of the Lord we could ask? Now, now that's basically like saying, isn't there a legitimate prophet anywhere? Isn't there someone here who will actually be in contact with the Lord? He, the idea is, I am not confident with these guys. I'm not confident with these prophets. 
Jehoshaphat does know the difference between true and false, between a genuine prophet and a false prophet. And so he asks a, a, a reasonable question. I, I'd like to have a, a prophet of the Lord, if you don't mind. That's, that's basically what's going on here. Uh, and the king of Israel, that's Ahab, said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imli, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. Now, this is, this is it's, it's so perfect to illustrate how people think. You love people who agree with you, and you hate people who don't. And here we have an instance where Ahab, because he's powerful, was able to raise up a group of yes-men, a group of sycophants, who would all go the party line and would whatever he wants to do, they say, oh yes, the Lord's all for that. And they would say it and they would give him all the confidence in the world. He loved them. But there's a prophet of the Lord who would just tell the truth. The truth. And since Ahab had, had already made enemies with the truth, he had made enemies with Micaiah as well. He, he said, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. In other words, let's give him a chance. Let's listen to what he has to say. Don't, don't write him off automatically. Uh, then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten thither Micaiah, the son of Imlah. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes. And in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. Now, let's catch the setting here. One of the laws of intimidation is to place yourself in a position of authority over someone else in a position of inferiority. Have you ever gone to a job interview uh, with somebody who had that caste system mentality and they're sitting behind this big mahogany desk in a leather chair and they sit you in a little iron chair that's, that's uh, you know, sitting three inches lower than the chair they're sitting in. And you're, you're sitting there in this chair real low and they're up high and you feel this small, right? Uh, well, they're sitting on their thrones, and they've got their robes on, and they're big shots, right? And, and not only that, but they had these 400 priests all lined up there too. So they bring Micaiah out, and they put on all their robes and sit in a, a big place like this, okay? And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, made him horns of iron. And said, Thus shall the Lord, with these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou hast consumed them. Now, sometimes prophets would do mimes. Uh, they would illustrate uh, their prophecies. And so he got these iron horns, you know, out like that. And he started running this way, you know, and running this way. He said, this is how you're going to get them. You're going to get them like this. You're going to get them like this. Woo! And he would go this way and he would go, woo. And, and so everybody's cheerleading. Everybody's all worked up. Everybody's excited now. And so there's this furor. There's this big uh, push. Everybody's supposed to be enthusiastic. Everybody's supposed to be on board. The king has got his robes on. The prophets are prophesying. And this guy's showing you just how it's going to happen. And there's Micaiah. He's just standing there watching all this stuff. The one man in the area who's really in tune with the Lord, he's watching all this. All right. And all the prophets prophesied saying, go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him saying, behold now. Now, now listen, here's my advice to you. They call Micaiah out and they, they say, this is what you need to know. Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. Now, what he's saying here is uh, you, you need to go along with the party line here, Micaiah. Quit being uh, negative. Uh, quit being such a naysayer. Uh, quit being such an antagonist. I mean, everybody's in on this. You need to do the same thing. They're waiting on you to come in and, uh, and, and, and say the same thing the others are saying. And Micaiah said, and this is the most irritating thing that you can hear uh, if you're not in, in tune with God. As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. In other words, I'm not listening to you. I'm not listening to them. I'm listening to God, and that's what I'm going to say. 
So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And I love this. And he answered him, Go and prosper. Now I'm reading it the way I believe he said it, because we will see that he is being sarcastic. And they pick up on it. So I'm going to say it in a sarcastic way because that's what's happening here. Go and prosper, for the Lord will deliver it into the hand of the king. Now, he said it in such a way as the sarcasm was dripping all over it. They picked up on it. Notice the the response. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? In other words, he knew he was just carrying on with him. He knew he was being sarcastic and a little bit smart aleck, which lets me know he was probably a Baptist prophet because Baptists are known to be a little bit cantankerous sometimes. And so he is just rolling his eyes. Oh, sure, go, go. Yeah, it'll be fine. You bet. You just head out there. Yeah, you're in good shape. All these guys, yeah. And, and so he's picking up on that. And he said, haven't I told you to tell the truth? So here it comes. Okay, here's the truth. And he said... I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. So that's the prophecy. That's the truth. That's what's going to happen. You ask for the truth, that's the truth. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? He said, I told you so. This guy is a wet blanket. This guy is a stick in the mud. This fellow will not go along. I told you. And he said, hear therefore the word of the Lord. Now, he's not through talking yet. He's got more to speak, okay? And he said, hear therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the hosts of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. In other words, around him were angels spirits. All right. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? Now, this is, this is a window into a heavenly scene. Micaiah is given a window into a heavenly scene because it was God's predetermined plan for Ahab to go and be killed in battle. You see, there was a prophecy against Ahab. He was under the curse of God. He was under the judgment of God. And it was just a matter of time until that prophecy was going to come true. And God knew, of course, exactly when it was going to happen and how it was going to happen. And so here is, uh, we're given the details of this heavenly scene. Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on this manner. Now, Now it's interesting that these different spirits had different ideas about how this could be done. And there came forth a spirit, and I believe this was a fallen spirit, in a similar fashion as Satan appeared before God and accused Job. Uh, we have now, I think, a lying spirit. I don't believe heavenly angels tell lies, do you? Uh, but, but I know that demons and fallen spirits do tell lies. And so this lying spirit, he came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail. Also, go forth and do so. Now, this is an interesting thing because here's, 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 it's something that's a little bit hard to handle, but there's also some comfort in it. Even the devil and his demons can't do anything unless God lets them do it. They are limited. And so, therefore, if they do something, they only do it with the permission of God. Now, that is why in the New Testament we have in, I believe it's uh, 2 Thessalonians, where it talks about the Holy Spirit, he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, he that hinders, he that controls, uh, he that limits, uh, he is, the Holy Spirit is limiting the work of Satan. So God here is uh, crafting and creating and orchestrating a scenario involving the fallen spirits, which everything that happens is coordinated with God's ultimate sovereign will. That's the part that we struggle with. But the the end result is there's going to be a lie. There's going to be a lie, and he'll believe the lie. Listen, I I don't want to 
I don't want to upset your minds and hearts too much. But here's the reality. God allows lies to be told. God allowed Satan to lie to Eve, did he not? God even allowed Satan to lie to his own son, Jesus Christ, in his tempting him. And so lies are allowed to be told. One day the Antichrist will show up and he will be the great liar. And God uses truth and the challenge of truth, which that's all a lie is, is the challenge of truth, to place you in a position to decide. To put you in a position, who will you believe? Will you believe God or will you believe the liar, Satan? And that's what's going on here. Now God knows that Ahab is set to believe the lie and to accept the liar. So he said, uh, you, this will work. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Now here we have uh, an intelligent and reasonable reaction to someone who's telling the truth of God. Uh, but Zedekiah, the son of Chenaniah, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek. Now here's what, here's what happens in Scripture. Someone speaking in the, in the name of God tells the truth using words, and someone who is lined up with Satan hits him. It's a pattern as old as time. Cain and Abel. Abel worshipped God properly. Cain worshipped God improperly. The two met together and one of them hit the other. And it wasn't Abel that hit Cain. It was Cain that hit and smote and killed his brother Abel. Jesus told the truth and they hit him in the face. They punched him until his face was not recognizable. They pulled out his beard and they whipped him and they tortured him to death on the cross. Why? For telling the truth. Now, Micaiah is a prophet of God. He's standing alone, and he's telling the truth, and someone hits him. And said, which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? In other words, what he's saying, he's taunting him. He's saying, you're such a spirit. Uh, you're such a, a prophet. You're such a diviner. Uh, you have such a discerning gift. Uh, what made me do that? What spirit moved me to punch you? Now that's the, the, the logic of those that follow Satan. Violence. Now let me ask you this. If you tell a lie, does it matter if you whisper it, tell it in a normal voice, or shout it? Does it become true how you say it? If you tell a lie and hit somebody while you're telling it, does that make it true? If you tell a lie and get a hundred other people to tell the same lie, does that make it true? If you tell a lie and get the majority of people to vote with your lie, does that make it true? Of course not. Micaiah is telling the truth and this other man is punishing him for telling the truth. He actually hits him. Uh, and here's what Micaiah said. Behold, thou shalt see in the day when thou shalt go into thy inner chamber to hide thyself. So he asked the question, what moved you to, to say this and what moved me to hit you? And he said, you're going to be more discerning when you're hiding in your bedchamber. You're going to be more discerning. You're going to understand what's going on here when you have to hide from what's coming. So he told him exactly what was going to go on. All right. And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, to Joash, the king's son, and say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with bread of affliction and with water of affliction, till I come in peace. Now, this, this is an interesting thing. First of all, it's kind of interesting to me that Micaiah is even alive in a place like that. A, a lot of the prophets of the Lord had been killed and murdered by Jezebel. A, a lot of the priests had been killed and murdered by Jezebel and, and with Ahab's, uh, uh, you know, being, being fine with that. So why was Micaiah still alive? You know, it's an interesting thing. Even the evil kind of still want to have it around. Even the evil still want to have a contact with the good. It's, it's a kind of a strange thing.
Uh, you will find people who are given over totally to sin, and somewhere in their house there's a Bible and devotional literature, and occasionally they'll tune in some religious broadcast and watch it. Uh, here's another illustration. Wicked Herod, wicked Herod the king, an ungodly, degenerate man, loved John the Baptist and respected him and John the Baptist was kind of like what we would call today his TV preacher. Uh, you know, it, you're not really committed, but it's entertaining. And so he would listen to John, and he feared him. And here's what the Bible says about Herod. He did many things because of the word of John. He actually did some things John said to do. He followed him. He respected him. Now, he, he didn't give over his sin. He didn't give up his rotten lifestyle. But, but he, he did respect John. But, but he, what, when it when push came to shove, what happened? He cut John's head off and put it on a plate and gave it to an exotic dancer. That's where Herod Hart really was. So here we have this. Put him in prison and feed him bread of affliction and water of affliction. Now, now what is that? Well, that's, that's just bread that's not good to eat and water that's not fit to drink. We're going to punish him. We're going to punish him for telling the truth. And he said, until I come in peace. And here's what Micaiah said. Micaiah said, if thou return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, hearken, O people, every one of you. And I believe he said that as they were carrying him off to his prison cell to be given stale bread and, and rotten, lukewarm water. But Micaiah stood alone. Now, let's think about this. It's a bad combination a bad combination, these two things, moral degeneracy and power lust. And through history, this is the worst combination of things that there can be. People suffer. People die. There is genocide. There is starvation. There is evil. There is wickedness. There is societal breakdown when there is degeneracy and power lust put together. This is the plague of humanity. Every two-bit dictator, every tyrant, uh, every uh, 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 head of state that, that, that rises to power by killing all of their uh, enemies and, and taking an entire country to their own will has been a degenerate and a power lustful individual. And we see this happening even today. There is a terrible thing that happens when moral degeneracy and political power come together. Now, Paul <laughs> was a nonconformist. Let's talk about standing alone. We see how Micaiah did it. Let's talk about standing alone. Paul was not one to just go along with what others were saying. He wanted to get his truth. He wanted to get his doctrine. He wanted to get his ideology directly from Jesus Christ. And he spent time with the Lord. He was given insight. He was given direction. And we come to Galatians chapter 2. Turn with me, if you will. Galatians chapter 2. And we'll look at verses 1 through 6. And we see an instance where there were some people uh, who thought that they could impress upon Paul to line up with their ideology. Now, Paul was a mover and a shaker. He was a persuasive man. He was a doer. He was a hard-working man. He, he was planting churches. He was winning people to Christ. Uh, he was training pastors. Uh, and so, notice in uh, verse 1 of Galatians 2, Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, I took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. In other words, I went to Jerusalem where all the original uh, ministers were, and I told them what I was doing. I told them what I was preaching, and I told them what I was doing. Uh, but, it, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Okay, now let's set the scene. What Paul was saying here is I have been out winning people to Christ in the Gentile nations. And I had a methodology and I had an ideology that some there in the church in Jerusalem may not be comfortable with. So I went to the leaders and I told them what I was doing and how I was doing it and how the Lord led me to do it. But I, I went to the leadership first because I didn't want to just come in and, <clears throat> and, and not be received well. All right, so what happened? 
But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. In other words, we, we didn't make him become a Jew in order to be part of the church. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now notice what he said. <clears throat> to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now, I just want to explain what this is. There were others who came up to me, and what they wanted to do is impose upon us and upon our converts the, Jude the Judean rules, the, the law, and all of these legalistic matters. And he said, I didn't listen to them. I didn't give them any weight. I didn't bow down to them. I didn't submit myself to them. I didn't go along with them. He said, I gave them uh, no, uh, no, uh, no ear. Uh, so he said, we gave them no place of subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, now, now this is interesting, these who seem to be somewhat, and then we have a parenthetical statement that's made. Whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. Now what he's saying here, these people were placed in positions of importance and they came across as people of importance, but he said that didn't impress me any because God doesn't accept anybody's person as more important than another. He was not going to go along with what they said because they had an office or they had some official status. For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Now what he's saying here is I am ministering for my Savior Jesus Christ directly to the Gentiles with what he has revealed to me. And the ideas that these people have are secondary to what God has called me to do. And they haven't added to me. They, they didn't have anything I needed to hear. So it's interesting that Paul's obvious nonconformist stance was not just a personality quirk. It wasn't just because Paul was naturally antagonistic. Uh, Paul had learned to listen to the voice of God. He had learned to submit himself to the will of God. And therefore, he would not be intimidated by those who put pressure on him. You know, a lot of church errors today, a lot of polity errors today, could be resolved if people would just read the Bible, and especially read the epistles of Paul. Uh, as somebody once said, and it's kind of a, a sarcastic thing to say, uh, the Bible has a way of shedding a lot of light on our theology. Well, in actuality, the Bible is supposed to be the very source and stay of our theology. So, another nonconformist, and we come to more modern times, I say modern is 200 years ago, but uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was perhaps the greatest preacher since the Apostle Paul. And if, as far as oratory ability goes, he is probably without peer in the course of Christian history. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon pastored the largest church in the world for many years. Uh, he personally financed orphanages. Uh, he had preacher boys that were trained under him and went out all over uh, uh, London and Scotland and Ireland and all over the world in missions. Uh, he, he wrote a lot of books, many of which are in my library. I've read a good number of them. Uh, he, he was as uh, uh, Pastor Tommy Nelson down in Texas had a word for Spurgeon. And at first it hits you kind of funny, but then you realize it. He says this to a group of us pastors. He, says, he said, you know Spurgeon was a freak, don't you? Now, we, we tend to think of freak as a negative thing, but he meant it in the best of terms. What he meant is there's no one like him. He is a, he is a, a human anomaly. He, he is in a class to himself. There is uh, no one that we can look at uh, that, that worked as hard, produced as much, and had as much results, and was as loved and as hated as Charles Haddon Spurgeon, and he died at 57. Many believe of a broken heart. Now, the thing about Charles Haddon Spurgeon, among all the other talents and gifts and anointings that he had, was this. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a nonconformist. He would tell what he thought and what he knew to be the truth, regardless of what other people said. He was polite, he was kind, but he was bold. 
And you either loved him for it or you hated him for it. He had a great sense of humor. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, like in every church, there would be people who were hard to handle, hard to deal with. And there was this one particular woman who was always negative, always complaining, always just had something bad to say. And so she came up and she would say, Mr. Spurgeon, I want to say that I did not care for your sermon of last week. And he would say, my lady, it is a beautiful day today if I don't say so myself. And then she would say, Mr. Spurgeon, the auditorium was entirely stifling this evening. The window should have been opened. And he says, yes, indeed, that was probably one of the blessed Sundays we've ever had. And he would walk away. And so she complained to one of the deacons. She said, you can't reason with the man because he's deaf as a post. <laughs> well, he was deaf on purpose. He was having a good time. He was going to be positive no matter how negative someone else was. Uh, the man was, was started out timid. He started out only like in his teens. I think he was 19 years old when he started in that church. But later he began to be so uh, favored and so successful that they ended up calling him the governor. He was the governor. Now, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a nonconformist. He was mercilessly criticized in the press. They wrote cartoons of him that, uh, that mocked him and made fun of him. They condemned him. They caricatured him. Uh, they called him an intellectual pygmy, when in reality he was an intellectual giant. The ecclesiastical leaders of his day were so envious and so jealous of him that they said the only reason he has success is because of his showmanship and his oratory. Uh, but he would make fun of them, and he said, I could be like you. And so he would get up and pretend to be one of them, and, and he said, I could speak all syrupy like you if I want to, but I'd rather speak like a man. And the people that loved him, loved him for it. I've got a book on my shelf. It's called Lectures to My Students. And it's a collection of the essays and lessons that Spurgeon would give to those preacher boys in his uh, class. And I tell you, you can't turn a page without laughing out loud. The man had a sense of humor. But at the same time, he was subject to depression, as many times hard workers like that are. But the point of this is that when his own denomination began to be infected with liberalism, questioning the basic doctrines of the faith. When I talk about liberalism, I'm talking about classic liberalism. Those who said it's not important that Jesus rose bodily from the grave. Spurgeon said it is vitally important. Those who said it's not important that Jesus was born of a virgin. Spurgeon said it is extremely important. They would try to downplay the miraculous uh, and Spurgeon would, would insist the miraculous is true. And because his denomination was giving in to liberalism, he said, let's pass a, revolution, uh, a resolution uh, to condemn liberalism, and they wouldn't do it, and he had to leave. And it broke his heart. He was so sad, he went into a fit of depression that lasted for years. And many p people believe that he died early, partly as the brokenheartedness of being disenfranchised, of being defriended, uh, of being marginalized from a group of brethren that he loved and wanted to have fellowship with, and had been tolerant of even those who didn't agree with him in many things. Spurgeon had friends in the Puritan group. He had friends in the Anglicans. He had friends with the Wesleyans. He had friends with the Puritans. But his own denomination could not handle someone that stood alone and told the truth. And so he had to leave. So Spurgeon, in the latter years of his ministry, was an independent, fundamental Baptist preacher. And that's how he died, with a broken heart. What is it that makes people hate you? Well, there's several things. When it comes to the things of God, people will hate you, listen, people will hate you if you refuse to recognize them as being special above others. Now what is special? Well, I'll tell you what it isn't. It's not special if everybody's special. The very word special means that some stand out over others. Special is a comparative term. It is a term that only operates when some are high and others are low. And so when you come to someone who views him or herself as high, and you elevate others to their level, they no longer feel special. You've robbed them of their status, and they will hate you for it. 
That's part of the reason the Pharisees and the scribes hated Jesus. Because he didn't recognize their special holiness. He said, okay, do what they say because they're in the positions they're in, but don't do like they do. You see, Jesus called them snakes in the grass. Jesus called them whited sepulchers. Uh, Jesus said they make the inside of their cup uh, dirty and the outside clean to fool you. Jesus raised people to a, a level of importance and they hated him for it. All right, people will hate you. People will hate you if you make them feel guilty. I've been a preacher of the Word of God for almost 40 years. And before that, I was active in church and teaching and leading youth. I'm here to tell you, there are people who will hate you for saying what the Word of God plainly teaches. They will hate you for saying it. They will hate you for making them feel guilty. Now, it isn't the preacher that makes them feel guilty. It's the Word of God. Uh, preachers are just the delivery boys. But they will take it out on you because there is this old thing, kill the messenger. And so people will hate you if you make them feel guilty. Number three, and we see this everywhere. We see this in churches. We see this in good, good Bible-believing churches. People will hate you if you challenge their prejudices. If people have a certain opinion and they've had that opinion a long time, and you make them rethink it, you challenge it, you suggest to them that maybe you don't have it all down right, maybe you ought to look at it a different way, maybe you're wrong on this point. There are a lot of times where people, instead of intellectually looking into what you're saying and examining it and getting out the Word of God, they will just automatically, reflexively hate you because people love to keep their prejudices. It's like a warm blanket. They hold on to it. And nothing, listen, nothing is harder to drive out of somebody than their hate. To get someone to stop hating is the hardest thing in the world to do. The poor are often led to hate the rich. The black are often led to hate the white, or the white are often led to hate the black. Racial division, economic division. There are some that look at anyone who's educated as snobs. But listen, there's some blue-collar snobs out there too. Educated people don't have the monopoly on snobbishness, I can tell you that. I grew up in the Deep South, a laborer from laborers, and I can tell you there's a lot of blue-collar snobs out there. And there's a lot of white-collar snobs, but hate. Listen, you try to get people to stop hating, you, you challenge someone's prejudice, and they will hate you for it. They hated Jesus for every one of those reasons. Jesus, listen, when, when Jesus told a story, and he wanted to have a hero in the story, he made the hero a Samaritan. That bugged the daylights out of them. He would say, be like that Samaritan. When Jesus made a hero of two people that were praying in the temple, one of them was a religious leader, and the other one was a tax collector. Jesus said the tax collector went to his house right with God more than the other one. Do you think they liked hearing that? No. Jesus was hated, rejected, slandered, mocked, falsely accused, persecuted, beaten, tortured, and crucified because this world could not tolerate God showing up in the flesh and telling the truth. And listen, when God comes in the flesh, believe me, He's standing alone because there is no other like Him. Jesus stood alone because he was unique. He was absolutely God in the flesh. 1 Peter chapter 4 warns us this way. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Now let's, let's put this in terms that we can understand. Don't be surprised if being a Christian may cost you something. Don't be surprised if some people are going to hate you because you follow Jesus. Don't be surprised. 
It's not a strange thing concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now what Peter is telling us to do, listen, when it costs you something to be a Christian, get happy! When people hate you for telling the truth, get happy! When people reject you and marginalize you for standing on the Word of God, get happy. That's a good thing. It's a plus. It's a positive. It puts you in good company. Now, right now, it doesn't seem so good. Do you think that Micaiah was having a good time when he was in that prison cell eating that rotten bread and that stale water? No, he was miserable. He was miserable. But how do you think Micaiah is doing right now? How do you think he's doing right now? What kind of position do you think he has in heaven? What, time, what kind of rewards do you think that he has enjoyed and is enjoying and will forever enjoy? And let's just think about it. Where do you think Ahab is today? You see, the majority will one day be the minority. Those winning today will be losers tomorrow. Those who are hated today will be loved in the company of angels and God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, and all the saints forever. Jesus put it this way in John chapter 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Listen, if Jesus had a hard time in this world, we're going to have a hard time in this world. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Jesus said to us clearly, so we would understand and not miss it, we're going to have to stand alone. We're going to be marginalized. We're going to be pushed around. You see, being a nonconformist is simply conforming to something higher, something holy, something true. Sometime when I would get into an argument with my mom, I don't remember ever winning an argument with my mom. I would want to do something. Maybe a friend of mine was doing it. And, uh, you know, I said, I want to go and do thus and such. And she would say, no. Uh, boys hate that word. No. And I would say, why? And she would say, because I said so. That's why. And then my next argument would say, but all of them are doing it. You know what the next answer was? If all your friends were jumping off a cliff, would you do that too? Well, it's kind of hard to argue with logic like that. But it occurred to me, well, they're not asking me to jump off a cliff. But here's the thing. How many times in human history has the majority been dead wrong? Absolutely, completely wrong. If you're standing alone, it may be good evidence that you're on the right side. If you're going against the grain of this fallen, wicked world, it just may be that you're the only one who's operating according to God's divine truth and principles. If you're standing alone, you're in good company. Because you're in there with Abraham, you're in there with Moses, and Joshua, and Elijah, and David, and Daniel, and Isaiah, and of course our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and all the apostles, and every faithful Christian since. We should have the courage to join the nonconformists. And let me put a salvation closing on this message. I doubt there's anyone listening to me who hasn't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. I doubt there's anyone listening to me who hasn't already heard that Jesus died for your sins. But now here's the thing. The same Bible that says Jesus died for your sins, the same Bible says that we can have salvation through His name, paints the world this way. There's two roads. And one of them is wide and very popular, and it leads to destruction. And the word many 
is used to describe the ones that are on that road. Many. Many are on that road. The other road is narrow and straight, and it leads to the gate of eternal life, and he used the word few. Few there be that find it. Now, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, when he illustrated this whole idea of heaven and hell, salvation and being lost, he used the word many to describe those that would be lost, and he used the word few to describe those that would be saved. Those aren't my words. Those are the words of Jesus Christ himself. So what does that mean? It means that the few are in the minority and the many are in the majority. The majority of the people who hear the gospel will reject it. But few will receive it. Will you be one of those few? And if not, why not? If you're going along with the world, you'll go the direction the world is going. But if you forsake the world, leave the world, and line yourself up with Jesus Christ and His followers, you will have eternal life. You're going to have some trouble here with those who still follow the, the devil and his word. But you're going to have a wonderful source of fellowship and encouragement and joy and grace and hope and truth and power for living and common sense and the hope of heaven if you come and you stand alone with Jesus Christ. Dear Father, I pray that someone will come to Christ as a result of this message today. I pray that someone will come to Him in prayer, surrendering for salvation, repenting of sin, pitching it away, leave the world, come to Christ. And Lord, I pray that Christians who have been playing around with the world and having one foot in the church and another foot out in this godless world, that they would move entirely to the church, that they would move entirely toward the cause of Christ, reject the Antichrist and his lies, reject this world and its sin. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're going to prepare for...